This content is brought to you by Uphold, which makes crypto investing easy. I've been a user of Uphold since 2017. They're one of my go-to exchanges. You can buy, sell, and trade cryptocurrencies on Uphold. You can also trade precious metals and equities. They have 10 plus million users, 250 plus cryptocurrencies, and they're available in 150 countries. As with all exchanges, you can buy and sell on them, but I highly recommend you custody your own crypto, not your keys, not your coins. If you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. I have with me John Deaton, who's of course uh, our crypto fighter, uh, representing 75,000 XRP holders and uh you know been representing the crypto industry for a while john uh, obviously great to have you on i don't even think you need introduction oh thank you tony it's always a pleasure to uh to be on with you you know i'm a big fan of of you and your mom <laughs> so john we've been talking for years now man um since this year haven't, haven't we <laughs> yeah and and uh since this lawsuit against ripple and even before you know this situation was highlighted to the entire crypto industry of all the dealings and ins and the in works of what the SEC was doing, and you know one of the things that that was uh, a top of mind for me when the Hinman emails came out was people came on my podcast and and many were saying this is conspiracy theory and and you guys are just making stuff up, but lo and behold we got the Hinman emails this week and. I think there's a lot of validation here. What are your thoughts on the, the document release? Uh, yes. Well, the first thing you said that we've been uh, speaking, you and I and the XRP community for years. And so this shirt I want to show you isn't just XRP, but it's the army um, because we fought it for a while by ourselves. And now and we warned people, you know, I was on your show saying, you know, this ripple case looks like it could be an attack against all of um, crypto because they're going after the tokens and they're going after secondary market sales. They're not limiting to just these promoters when they sell. And so, so that part of the case, we've been validated, but we've also been validated. You know, I was called a grand conspiracy theorist by people. And I don't mean any particular person, just in general, uh, right. the consensus people, if anyone ever gave me a compliment for what I was trying to do, uh, they would say, why are you promoting a conspiracy theory guy? And and that's all, you know, they all have to eat those words now because um, it just the emails proved that um, ETH was highlighted by Bill Hinman to be given regulatory clarity what we've been calling a free pass that's a fact the first draft of the speech isn't called the eth speech but bill hinman later calls it the eth speech mm -hmm. when the when the ethereum folks first wrote a memo where they only highlighted ethereum you know jay clayton went and said to A16Z, said, hey, put together what you want. Put it in writing, send it to Bill. And they did. And that first draft of the Hinman speech, the same phrases that were in that memo are in that speech, right? So you do have people who are vested helping formulate this regulatory free pass. And then you fast forward, and you even have the Office of General Counsel saying, I don't think you should put that statement of ETH. Yeah. And what your what your viewers need to understand, Tony, is that Bill Hinman could have given that speech without ever naming a token. He could have said that there's a new construct that we're looking at called sufficient decentralization. And when we look about these tokens, here are factors that we're going to consider. And he could talk about the token ownership, or he could talk about how many validators or nodes or, or you know, it, is there a percentage of token ownership that is a red flag? He could have said, here are some markers for you entrepreneurs to think about. He didn't have to say 
setting aside the fundraising that accompanied Ethereum, we at the SEC view current sales of Ethereum as non-securities. He didn't have to do that. So what I had said was I made one prediction about these emails and I did it intentionally to those people that called you know, me a conspiracy theorist and you a conspiracy theorist and everyone else. I said, I don't know what those emails are, how they're going to impact the lawsuit or the underlying case that Ripple has, but I bet they make people go, damn, why did you give the speech? Mm -hmm. You know, and when you have a director of another division saying, you're going to cause greater confusion if you give this speech and he ignores it. If you have the Office of General Counsel saying, I don't think you should highlight ETH and he does it. Uh, and all the other things that were said, oh, the Office of General Counsel said that part about whether or not a group of, in, of uh, people own a certain amount of the token, the Office of General Counsel said that's irrelevant. Bill Hinman kept it. Now, who do you think he was thinking of when he kept it? He's thinking that Ripple owned 50 percent. I mean, let's just call it like it is. Right. Yeah. And so. So, yeah, uh, ETH gate was real. It was always real. Um, uh, selective enforcement mm -hmm. was real. It was always real. And there was never been uh, a conspiracy. I always say to people, it's a conspiracy until it's proven true. Right. And so I think I think now everyone says, OK, this really is suspect, you know, and then when you add the conflicts of interest. That answer to the question, why did he insist on giving that speech? Then when you consider it, it highlights him even more. Right. And that why didn't you get it approved by the ethics office? How come they're not on the each of uh, the 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 um, email chain? All these other divisions are. How come they're not? Um, wait a minute. You know, you collected 15 million ongoing partner. You met them anyways. Oh, wow. You work now as a partner with the people that helped you write the speech. <laughs> I mean, at some point, you have to say enough is enough. Right. It's just not coincidence, man. <laughs> you line all right. these. I mean, up. I mean, let, let's let's use Mr. Gensler's test. <laughs> Does it look like a duck, Tony? <laughs> Does it right. walk like a duck? Does it quack like a duck? It's a duck. OK, so so hopefully we'll we'll get an investigation. I um, and uh, you have independent and I always used to tell people on conspiracy. Then why did Empower Oversight do what they did? Mm -hmm. They're not XRP holders. They're not crypto token holders. They just want transparency and ethical government. Right. So so are they part of the grand conspiracy theory? No. And uh, and look what we learned. So all those people need to shut up now and just be like, OK, we were wrong. They were right. You know, doesn't change the case that much, maybe, but it certainly validates us. For sure. And I think it also just uh, further destroys Gary Genser and the SEC's credibility because we're just seeing a lot of lies, a lot of flip flopping from Gary himself, even outside of the situation. But this further puts a spotlight on it. Like, what are we dealing with here? This is an agency that lacks integrity. How can we trust them? And I think uh, that will probably I think we're starting to see Congress move a bit here uh, as a result. We're seeing Patrick Henry and these folks going on the offensive. Um, so. On that note, you know, does these emails uh, matter more of a court of a public opinion or do they also impact the SEC Ripple lawsuit? Well, they don't impact, you know, a lot of people were expecting like maybe potentially a bombshell or something like that as far as the case. It doesn't affect the judge's decision. Did Ripple ever offer or sell XRP as a security it doesn't it doesn't impact that now it definitely impacts the case against brad garlinghouse and chris larson mm. because they're charged with that aiding and abetting charge which requires the sec to prove 
a jury would have to believe that they were reckless. Hmm. Reckless means under the law that it that XRP is obviously a security to a lay person and they should have known it because it's so obvious and because they didn't, they were reckless. Now, how in the world could the SEC like prove that case? They can't. And so those emails about you're going to cause greater confusion and and pushback, that that's very helpful. So if the judge says, Ripple, I'm going to allow you to argue to the jury, I'm going to find that you violated the law, say 2015, 16, whenever, but I'm going to allow you to argue to the jury that you didn't have fair notice about what the law was then those emails can come into play. Mm. Now, a lot of folks want to know, will Bill Hinman and possibly Jay Clayton, maybe not Jay Clayton, but it will face consequences. Uh, it doesn't seem likely because it's the revolving door and they'll find maybe some way out, you know, doorway out of the situation. Do, do you think there's any probability? Right, well, here, let, let, let me make it clear. Uh, mm. I've said, and, and, until we saw the Empower emails, the first year, I never said Bill Hinman violated the law. Mm. I said it looked bad. It's possible he violated the law, but I'm not going to accuse a man of violating the law unless I got clear, unequivocal proof. Right. When the Empower Oversight emails showed that he was told by the ethics chief, you have a criminal bar. If you even email, call, talk, or meet with your partners, you are violating the law. Mm. When he's told that, and then he meets them three more times minimum, and he meets them on a day that he's, a letter goes out from his division about the Canon IPO, that's clear evidence that he, he violated the law. He knew he was not supposed to. He was told not to. He disobeyed that directive, and he did. He's guilty. Now, does that mean he would go to jail? No, he mm -hmm. wouldn't go to jail for this. I know people, you know, they are upset and they want that. Um, the question is, will he ever be investigated? And that's the question. Now we have, uh, you know, crypto law was the first one to call for an investigation. I ran the videos. I had connect to Congress about it. Now we've got student Alderodi calling for an IG investigation. We have Empower calling for an IG investigation. Um, and so I think that the chances of that have increased. John Reed Stark, I saw someone yeah. commented today that he supports it, which he, he told me before he would support it. Um, if you have people uh, that believe in the SEC as an institution. Like there are people like John Reed Stark and I, you know, we disagree on everything about crypto, right? Yeah. But, but he's a true believer in the institution. I'm not. I don't believe in the SEC, right? I think it's a broken agency. Yeah. But he worked there for 18 years. He believed in what he was doing was right. So he believes it. Well, if you're like him and you believe in the integrity of the institution, you should support an IG investigation and clean that shit up, right? Mm -hmm. If if the law was broken, hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. You're a regulator who enforces the law, Tony. You have to hold yourself accountable to the law before you can hold others. And so um, I think the chances increase, increase, increase. If I were Bill Hinman, I would be a lot more nervous today than I was a year ago. Oh, I bet. I, I, I was thinking on my own, if, uh, you know, he's going to depart A16Z just to maybe distance himself from, you know, those connections, but we'll see what, what happens there. Yeah. Well, I know that I read his deposition. I know right now he's a paid advisor. The longer he stays, he gets a piece of the company. Mm. So like right now, uh, it, I guess it's in his financial interest to try to hang on so he can get equity in A16Z. But um, we'll see now. There's always a chance, depending on what other evidence comes out, like Empower Oversight is also seeking the emails between 
Hinman and the SEC and consensus and Joe Lubin and Vitalik and all of them, if there's more evidence, then there's always a chance that there could be some other kind of accountability. You know, let's say there's a semi-aggressive attorney out there that's not willing to piss off the big boys. <laughs> I don't know. If, maybe there's a guy out there that uh, might be able to do something about it. We'll see. Mm. Uh, let's talk about the Ripple lawsuit. Um, everybody's uh, in high anticipation of Judge Torres's uh, ruling. Um, you know, it could happen today, could happen next week. What are your thoughts? Um, do you think we hear something very soon? Yeah, you know, I thought it was interesting. Uh, Mark Fago, uh, who was on my crypto law show with Jeremy Hogan, um, former SEC, uh, like chief, regional chief, uh, a guy who knows the SEC in and out. Um, he, he said two interesting things. One, he said he thought the SEC should win, but he thinks that the SEC may lose. Um, I found that interesting. And he also said he, he expects the decision any day now. Now, I expected the decision before today. Mm. You know, I said that I wouldn't be shocked if it took, you know, through the summer, but I would be surprised if we were in June and it was still pending. And we're in June and it's still pending. Uh, so I'm also in the camp that we could get a decision today. We could get a decision next week. Uh, I've told XRP holders, I'm really, really confident that the worst case scenario is September. Mm -hmm. uh, and I and I, I say worst case because some people think it's going to be, you know, next year. Right. Yeah. There's some people. Well, if September 30th comes and she hasn't decided, she has to report herself to Congress mm -hmm. and say, I have been waiting to rule on this massively important decision for nine months and I'm still haven't done it. You know, no, it's like a, it's like a, think about that list as like a public shaming list. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, a judge doesn't want to go on that list because it looks like they're not, he or she's not doing their job and they're not, you know, being diligent. So, I'm very confident that Judge Torres would never allow herself to go on that list. So therefore, that's what gives me the confidence to say it's not going to be Christmas. It's not going to be January. It's, you know, it's, it's going to be between now and September. Boy, I hope I hope it's next week. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if it's good news, I hope it's I hope it's tomorrow. It's tomorrow, Friday, right? Oh well, uh, oh tomorrow's Saturday. So today, today's Friday. So I'm hoping you know maybe maybe she does something uh, before the end of today. But who knows? Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean to be fair, let let let's let's be fair to you know. And I know there's people get pissed off at this, but it, <laughs> it's how it's how I feel. Um, how big is this decision when it relates to the financial markets in the United States of America? It's huge. I mean, is there anything bigger in global trade and finance today than Bitcoin, Not central it. bank digital currencies, ETH, XRP, just crypto in general? It's a pretty big decision. And if the SEC wins, Gary Gensler is going to make this to be the biggest victory in SEC history. Right. If the SEC loses, he'll just be like, oh, well, we won one in library and we won lost one in XRP. And he'll try to equate them and say it's no big deal. Facts and circumstances. Each case is different. But a lot is about what you brought up, that public opinion and, and Congress, what you've already been talking about on your show here today. If 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 the SEC wins outright. That's going to give Gary Gensler validation. Yeah. They're all securities. I told you. Can you imagine what Elizabeth Warren? We're going to hear Elizabeth Warren talking about the Ripple case. Yeah. Brad Sherman, too. Yeah. Right. If the SEC wins. Right. And so, but if the SEC loses, then you've got the Tom Emmers and you've got the Warren Davidsons. You've got the Patrick McHenry's, the French Hill. They're going to be like, look, you see, 
you cost this company $200 million, you overreached, it wasn't a fraud case, you prosecuted them unfairly while you're meeting with the Bernie Madoff of crypto. And so it, it has a big deal to both legally and politically. Now, on that note, you know, with the hearing in Congress, we had one this week on Tuesday, June 13th, and all of a sudden, an unknown firm or a firm that's not well known by the name of Prometheus. They're known today. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Pops out of nowhere. Um, and all of a sudden, they're repeating, the, the CEO is repeating the talking points of uh, Elizabeth Warren and Gary Genser. You know, what is your take on here? Something smells fishy. It, se- it seems like a potential plant by, by Gary Genser and Elizabeth Warren. Well, you and I are going to be called conspiracy theorists, <laughs> right? Because uh, it's absolutely a plant. Uh, I, I wish I could. I wish I knew who did this on Twitter because I want to give them credit. Mm. Um, but I, I just I saw it and I was I was driving and I shouldn't have been looking at my phone, but whatever. And um, uh, when you think of Promethean, think of a vending machine. Mm. nothing in it it's a vending machine and you can't get a candy bar you can't get some crackers you can't get some chips there's nothing in it that's promethean Mm. right 75 percent of the market is bitcoin and eth can't trade it on their platform so what's the point right and so you you think of that and then you know that the CEO wrote a letter in April of 2021 that said, we need new laws on crypto. We need this. We need that. And today he says, it's been very clear from the beginning. And he issues those talking points that you were talking about. So you tell me, what's that mean? It means he got paid off. It means he cut a deal. Uh, he was the Democrats um, witness for a reason. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I hate talking politics because XRP holders were, were Republicans, were Democrats, were independents. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But Elizabeth Warren chose to go anti-crypto for a reason. Like her platform for re-election is anti-crypto. And, you know, her and Gary Gensler are close. And so um, Maxine Waters of the Financial Services Committee in Congress, the same committee as Patrick McHenry. She used to be the chairwoman mm-hmm. uh, when they were in control. She just put out that tweet of what an amazing job Gary Gensler is doing. How he's protecting Tony and John and all the other crypto retail holders out there and so i just i wish they wouldn't have went that way now of course there's going to be good democrats who are are crypto friendly but right now they're not the ones in power though right Right. and their voices are that's the 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 point yeah right that's that's the point and so it's i don't i don't want crypto to become a republican versus democrat thing i really don't yeah i mean I recently interviewed Congressman Darren Soto. He's he's a champion for crypto and blockchain. There's Richie Torres, and there's a, a few others, but their voices are being buried with Elizabeth Warren's, you know, campaign and Brad Sherman. Like they, uh, you know, are making the louder noise here. So that's all you see from a Demo- Democrat party, even though they're folks working behind the scenes. And I wish, you know. Uh, some way we could amplify the voices of, of those who are actually doing work. Well, that's the thing. Uh, it, that's what I meant by those in power. Shira, Sherrod Brown and Elizabeth Warren are on the banking committee in the Senate. Brad Sherman and Maxine Waters were the lead Democrats in the financial service committee in the House. When the House was in power, you know, they wouldn't have any hearings on crypto. Mm-hmm. Now we're having hearings. And so, yes, that's why I wanted to make a point that there are good uh, Democrats out there that believe in crypto, believe in a free market, but we just need them to rise to power. Mm, for sure. Or influence, rise to power and influence. Um, now, on that note, yesterday, uh, I saw Patrick McHenry put out a very interesting tweet. 
This was after BlackRock announced that they are launching or they're filing for a Bitcoin spot ETF. Patrick McHenry tweeted that news out, tagged Gary Gensler and said, I'm going to be watching this very closely. Uh, yes, essentially hinting, are you going to approve uh, the, the, the 10 applicants, 10 to 12 applicants that have been filing for years? Or are you going to approve BlackRock? Um, I think there's two layers to that. One is BlackRock entering the market. And two, what's Gary going to do here? Give the incumbents the uh, opportunity and the advantage or uh, you know, these new startups? Well, uh, my, my first inclination is that he will blatantly give it to the incumbents because, you know, when I was on Charles Payne, I, I said that on live TV and Charles, I said, listen, he's crushing crypto so that the incumbents can get a bigger slice. Mm -hmm. And Charles Payne said to me, well, John, they've been doing that for, <laughs> you know, you're not saying anything new. They've been doing that for, uh, for decades. And so. Uh, I saw an interesting uh, tweet by Nick Carter uh, before I came on here, and he made an interesting point, which was, one, it could be that, but it also could be that maybe the SEC isn't feeling confident about the Grayscale case. Mm -hmm. And so they've told BlackRock, we may lose uh, Grayscale, and so GBTC gets, we have to give them, you know, like the conversion to an ETF and we don't want them to be the only one you get in line too. Like it could be like that kind of thing. I thought that was a very astute uh, way of looking at it as well. He sure. could be anticipating a loss. So therefore let's make sure one of his incumbent friends get a piece too. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I didn't actually think about that, but I know some folks have been saying it looks like Grayscale is going to win uh, that lawsuit against the SEC. But that that's a great point, um, and it could certainly be the case. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, you know, listen, there should have been a, a spot Bitcoin ETF granted minimum two years ago, if not four years ago. Um, so. Uh, to me, it's a shame that you only let a uh, derivatives and a short Bitcoin ETF, which only that's for professional traders. That's right. for hedge funds. That's for the Black Rocks. Right. But, you know, Joe Schmo mechanic um, who just wants to, you know, put a hundred bucks in Bitcoin once a month because that's all he can afford so he gets a little exposure to it in an ETF. i mean he he's shit out of luck you know what i mean and so uh th that that's just that's just pathetic man mm -hmm. um now you got gary genser going after two of the biggest exchanges obviously they filed a lawsuit against binance or specifically binance us and then surprisingly going after coinbase an exchange they green lighted to do an ipo and you know, we're okay with their services. Now, all of a sudden, they're going after them for those services. What is your take on that? Um, you were obviously way ahead of the curve, you know, since when we started talking, Gary Genser was going to go after everything, exchanges, platforms, points. You know, what's your take on, on these exchanges getting sued? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I even said that on uh, Liz Clayman's show with Charlie Gasparino last year. Now, I was wrong. I said by the end of the year, which was December. And so, you know, I was four months, five months off, but, um, but I, the writing was on the wall and that's why I couldn't understand the tribalism that was still going on. To me, the writing was, was on the wall and, and it's, I gotta believe in my heart that Gensler's a smart guy, like evil brilliance. Right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I mean, you don't become the youngest partner in Goldman Sachs history, without being a smart, conniving, clever, devious person, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So does he think that he can kill crypto in the United States? Well, you're not going to kill Bitcoin for sure. And can you get rid of a bunch of scammy coins and all that kind of stuff? Sure. But, but you know, if, if Ripple loses, it's the status quo. They just appeal. And, you know, XRP will take a hit, I'm sure, you know, maybe it goes down to 19 cents again, and then it 
Grinch eventually comes back up and then we just go through the peel process. Um, is he going to kill Ethereum? No. Is he going to kill XRP? No. You know, then you got Quant. You got, th- there's legit projects out there. And right. so, so if he can't kill it, boy, I can crush it. And when I crush it, the Black Rocks, the Goldman Sachs, the JP Morgans, they come in and they they get bigger slices, man. I mean, I just really think that's what's happening. Okay. And I think I think that maybe it's JP Morgan, maybe maybe it's Jamie Dimon, maybe it's Larry Fink, maybe it's someone that you know comes in and says, Hey, Gary, phone rings. Yeah, it's Larry Fink. Uh, I just bought 25% of Coinbase on the open market, right? Um, Let's strike a deal. And then all of a sudden now they're going to talk about some way to carve out how you can list tokens and blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? And, And then all of a sudden the SEC takes a softer approach when those players get bigger slices. I mean... Now that is speculation on my part, but I mean, does he really think he could? Because I see so many people saying he's going to kill crypto. He's trying to kill crypto, and I just don't know if he could kill it. Not when it's not when the UK is is promoting it, China and the UAE and Dubai, and I just you know you could hurt it, you could hurt it, man, Mm -hmm. Uh, and you could stall it, but can you kill it? And if you can't kill it, crush it. Yeah. And I think it's to your point, the crushing it is the agenda uh, because we saw Operation Choke Choke Point, despite, you know, some of these banking folks who are crypto friendly getting shut off, um, you know, like Silvergate and so forth. Exchanges are still running. They just went and found other banking partners, Uh, despite these lawsuits and Cardano and all these things getting thrown into lawsuits. Those coins are still trading. There's still an international uh, volume, right? It, the people in, in the other countries are not scared. They're not like, oh, whatever. They're, uh, okay, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll skip, still keep trading it. But here in the United States, some of these smaller folks, Robin Hood and so forth, started delisting. Um, so on that note, John, are you planning to in, uh, inject yourself into any of these other token communities a la what you did for the XRP community or, you know, uh, advising other lawyers like, hey, you can be. Well, I mean, I mean, right now what I did is uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but I I, I put together another uh, like list of Coinbase cu- customers, Binance customers. And, you know, and it's it, a lot of XRP holders, you know, uh, I love them. They love me. But a lot of them, you know are really mad at Coinbase, right? And so they're like, wow, John, I can't sign it. And I'm not telling them to, I'm not asking. But if you are a Coinbase customer and you don't want the SEC speaking for you, then I'm saying, then maybe we can sign up, maybe become a meekest counsel in those cases, just so the courts hears the customer's version, right? Because they're claiming, you know, but a lot of people didn't get a lot of attention to this, Tony, but uh, Gary Gensler had 10 states join him, and they all sent cease and desist letters, New Jersey and Alabama and Washington, the state of Washington, that said, uh, stop offering your staking. Well, you know, so if you're a, if you're a, 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 a crypto holder and you're getting – you know, ETH off staking, and they're saying that that's a security. Mm-hmm. And, and that, and if you don't feel the way and you don't want their type of protection, then join it. Now, you know, I don't, as far as like, you know, every other token, uh, I mean, I can't say that, uh, like, I, I do have to pay my bills, right? like my job. <laughs> and so I, I have clients, so I can't, dedicate everything but i'm gonna i'm going to do you know listen i didn't own library credits i still don't own library credits but i got involved uh because uh i believe in this i believe in i believe in the potential 
for you know bitcoin and crypto much like you you know i have a similar story that we've talked about and so um i uh you know so i i care about it so I'll, i'm going to stay as involved and fighting as i can i mean you know i uh when bitcoin first when i first read bitcoin tony when i first read about peer-to-peer um my mother was on you know i was grew up on welfare and food stamps and a single mom in the, one of the worst cities in america in this inner city of detroit michigan um and the truth is my mom didn't have a bank account until she was in her 40s when when the government started um doing direct deposit for welfare mm. Right. And so my mom would go. There's a reason there's a ch- uh, check cashing in the hood. You always go to the inner city and you'll see like check cashing places. Right. They take 10, 15 percent. And and so my mom could because she couldn't afford to keep 50 dollars in the in the checking account or right. If you can't, you need every penny for food and all that. So so when I thought of Bitcoin, I thought of like, wow, like the unbanked, like my mom, you know what I mean? Um, Or someone in Nigeria or someone in Brazil, they could like make hats and get a smartphone and create a website and participate, right? Participate in an economy and capitalism and all that. And so I fell in love with that concept. Now it hasn't turned out that way, unfortunately, like, you know, uh yet but i still believe in the the promise of some of it and so i'm going to continue to fight you know whether i'm amicus in 67 tokens (laughs) i'm not going to say that (laughs) yeah that's tough and and then like you said you have a business to run you've got other cases like you're working on to put food on the table right um so uh certainly understand that but i think you created a great model. And I know you've talked about decentralized justice that a lot of other attorneys can pretty much take the blueprint, right? And and go do absolutely. this. Listen, absolutely. The bottom line is, is speaking for the individual. That's all. The SEC is not doing the, the work of the people. They're not protecting investors. They are in a political uh, they they are an arm of politics. They become, you know, a weapon for special interest, political agendas, and things like that. And so, our only hope is in the courts. And so, we have to go into court, and we have to fight. And and so far, you know, we're getting little victories here and there. And hopefully, this Ripple case will be a big victory. I hope. Yeah. Uh, hopeful too, and even grayscale. Um, and I, I, one thing I like is that these folks are fighting back. Like I saw Binance, they brought in a SEC uh, lawyer, I believe it was, to fight back. Coinbase is fighting back. So uh, as the industry starts to go on the offensive, um, you know, I think all, all those things are going to help. Um, and I like that these judges are are calling out the bullshit of the SEC. I'm seeing it in different cases. Just even this week, Binance where the SEC wanted to freeze the assets, judges like, no, uh, figure it out. And and also, do you have proof that they were doing such and such? The SEC did yeah. not. Well, that's the thing. In the Voyager case, uh, the SEC lawyers wanted to talk to the judge in private. He said, no, you got to do it in the public, in the domain. Um, and then he criticized them. Obviously, we know Judge Netburn said that they lack faithful allegiance to the law in the Ripple case. In the Grayscale case, they were saying, you know, you're being completely inconsistent between a spot Bitcoin and a, a futures. The same rules apply. The mm-hmm. same type of manipulation is available between the, both. Your argument makes no sense. Um, and, uh, and like you said, with Binance, Binance came in, they did the right thing. Uh, and I'm not defending Binance, the institution, I'm just saying this specific argument, they came in and said, we hear all of the American customers assets, 100%. Here's the private keys. We're handing it to you government. So we can't move the money. Uh, so you forever have it. Um, but don't freeze us because then we can't make payroll. Right. And would the SEC say that? No, not good enough. 
So the judge was like, okay, that's bullshit. You know, like, so you're not interested in real justice. You're interested in like crushing this company. And by the way, John, right before we came on, I read that Binance US laid off like 50 people citing uh, legal costs. So already having an impact, not oh, on, wow. right, on, on the common man who's just working there or, yeah. and, and obviously they wanted to cut the assets off, uh, sure. which would affect the retail investors. Sure. Somebody left a job to go work at Binance USA. They have a mortgage, they have a couple kids, and they just got laid off today, you know, because of what the SEC's uh attempting to do there, you know, now that doesn't mean if Binance did some things wrong, they right. should they should, you know, be held accountable to it. Um, but there's a way to go about it. That's all. Yeah, no, exactly. And and we're not saying Binance are their angels or anything like that. But I, I think now people are not even focusing on the company that's getting sued. They're just looking at the SEC because they don't trust the SEC anymore. They don't trust Gary Ganser. And and I, I see that sentiment spreading, um, even if Binance did something bad, right? Let's say they, they rightfully so the SEC is going after them. The SEC has tarnished their reputation so uh, bad that people are just like, I don't, I don't know. I, I need to see what the judge says because I right. don't know what they're putting together here is, if it's true. Right. And and what I encourage everybody to remember is just because the SEC says, you know, something's a security doesn't make it security. Yeah, it doesn't. It, do, it doesn't even make it close to being a security. You know what I mean? We'll see. We'll see what the judges say. So, John, final question we here for you. When are you coming to New Jersey or New York so I can take you out for that steak dinner I owe you that we've been talking about for two years or something? Well, uh, sometime <laughs> soon. Hopefully, I'll, I'll come out there. I'd like to. I'd like to. Uh, you don't have to buy me a steak dinner, but uh, like to hang out and uh, and uh, talk to you. I, as I, you always know, I think that you're uh, you're one of the good guys in this uh, in this industry who care about uh, your fellow individual retail holders, and you use your voice uh, to improve that. And so, uh, uh, I'm always going to make time for you, brother. I'm a man of my word. We're going to go to American Cut in Tribeca in the city. You're going to get a, wow. like a, a really nice steak. Promise. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> but you know what? You know what? I'm really looking forward to eating a steak dinner. I might, you know, I, when Charlie Gasparino has to pay for it because of that <laughs> bet, right? So, so. Uh, well, what's uh, up with him, by the way? What's going on with him? Uh, I mean, I haven't talked to Charlie yet. Listen, people got to understand about Charlie. And this is just me. Like, I've met Charlie. I've had dinner with him several times. I like Charlie. I, I'm very fond of him. I have a great time uh, drinking with him and having a dinner and stuff like that. When it comes to the ethics and the case, we're all about our experiences and our perspective. And this is my theory. Charlie is one of the longest standing Wall Street journalists. He's mm. been doing it for decades. Mm. So when you talk about the Hinman stuff, Charlie would be like, man, I've seen so much worse than that. Right. Yeah. So you become desensitized to, I guess, the revolving door. Charlie has talked about the revolving door before. And so, yeah, you know, he'll say to me, yeah, it looks awful, but, you know, there's so much worse going on there. Or if I'll say, well, the ethics office said, you know, don't talk to your, uh, you know, your partner. Well, why should he stop seeing his friend? Like, that doesn't mean he's doing anything wrong. And that's how he feels and, and doesn't, you know, he could be wrong, but that doesn't make him a bad guy. Right, you know I mean? right. That's like, a good think, point. He, he, he thinks I'm wrong, I'm sure, about some things, but but we still can go out and have a great time and have a friendship and and enjoy each other's company. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, that's good context. And I, and I think that's helpful because you don't think about, yeah, he's been seeing so many things in Wall Street and the Bernie Madoffs and the 2008 crash and even before that, Enron and all those things, right? And, and, he, and, he, and he, you got to remember the stuff that off the record that he can't talk about that he he probably knows. You know what I mean? Like, if I, so if, I, if I'm if i having a drink with Charlie and, you know, we're shooting the shit and, and I say something and he'd be like, boy, if I could tell you what I know, like, 
like he's thinking of these things that he's seen and 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 reported on and so it, it's all relative you know what i mean um in your experience and so uh and we all have our confirmation bias and so True. but but i just wish there would be less uh animosity about everything like we you know what i mean it's like it's why i brought mark fagel on mark fagel was on crypto law at one time uh, he made a joke about, wow, first thing I've ever agreed with John Deaton on, right? Like early on, and I laughed and 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 he, and he disagreed about something else with me. And I said, hey, well, come on the show. And and we agree on a lot of things and we have some disagreements, but man, it, I don't I don't know where we've lost our ability to to disagree without being disagreeable, you know? Yeah. And social media doesn't help, you know, because you, you get into that echo chamber and, and tunnel vision a bit. I think there's a bit of that in person. I'm sure people would not communicate, obviously not communicate that way. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But John, anyways, it's a pleasure, man. Always a pleasure, my friend. Uh, and right. like I said, we got to do that steak dinner, but uh, thank you so much. We will. we will talk to you later. 